What is multi-cluster DNS? Why do we need multi-cluster DNS? And why the heck do we even need multiple Kubernetes clusters to begin with? Let's answer all of that right now. Hi, my name is Morris, and if you're new here, I make videos on DevOps and Kubernetes. If that sounds interesting to you, then stick around, because today we're discussing something very important in distributed infrastructures like Kubernetes, and that is multi-cluster DNS. As you may have gleaned from the name itself, multi-cluster DNS is nothing more than having consistent DNS service running across two or more Kubernetes clusters. Meaning, if you have two clusters, for example, you should be able to seamlessly resolve domain names of the a second cluster from the first cluster and vice versa. Now, of course, the key to making all of this happen is a combination of external DNS, core DNS, and etcd. We're going to take a look at a practical multi-cluster DNS example, and I will have all the manifest files and setup instructions linked in the description so you can take a look and try it out in your own environment too. But before we can dive into the technical setup, I want us to first address an assumption we are making right from the get-go, and that of course is that we need and indeed do have multiple Kubernetes clusters in our organizations. Why the need for this added level of complexity? Why not just keep things simple and run everything in one Kubernetes cluster? If isolation was the goal, isn't the isolation we already have at the container, pod, or namespace level sufficient? Maintaining more than a single cluster might seem to be more trouble and simply not worth the hassle, but actually, in most cases, it is the recommended design choice. In fact, for most, if not all, organizations using Kubernetes, running several clusters is the norm rather than it being a rare occurrence. And if you take a look at some of the reasons many choose to run multiple clusters, you will no doubt agree that it is the wise design choice. Now, of course, we cannot exhaust all the reasons organizations run multiple clusters, but let's break down just a few of the most common ones. The first and most common reason is isolation of environments. In software development, it is common to have multiple environments such as testing, development, staging, and production. Each environment has different requirements, resources, and configurations. In this kind of setup, changes made in one environment will not impact the other environments. So developers can freely test their code in a testing environment without worrying about affecting other environments. The same strategy works in production environments too. You can allocate more resources, for example, to one production cluster to ensure that the resource-intensive applications in that cluster run smoothly. And then for all your other smaller workloads, you maintain another less optimized production cluster. The second reason is geographical redundancy, which helps with fault tolerance and disaster recovery. This is achieved by running multiple clusters in different regions with copies of the same applications, making them highly available even in the event of a disaster or an outage. So if you're running critical applications that require 247 availability and cannot afford any downtime, this would be a very ideal design choice. Based on these examples, we can observe several key points about a multi-cluster environment. First, each cluster has its own unique configuration and it's managed by its own team. Additionally, there are frequent and ongoing configuration changes occurring at a very high frequency, including the addition or removal of services, ingresses, and domains. Now, an obvious problem is that communication between the clusters can be challenging without the proper networking and DNS setup. So we need to have a reliable method for DNS resolution across clusters to ensure that the services can discover and communicate with each other seamlessly. To address this problem, we have the external DNS project, which allows for automatic DNS record creation and management based on Kubernetes resources. It can be used to create DNS records in external DNS providers, such as AWS Route 53 or Google Cloud DNS. You can take a look at the external DNS GitHub project to learn more and to check out tutorials on how you can set it up for many other DNS providers. In our practical example today, we'll be looking at a setup on an on-premise cluster, so we'll use CoreDNS as our DNS provider. CoreDNS is a DNS server that is commonly used in Kubernetes clusters. And yes, this will require setting up another instance of CoreDNS in our clusters. I say another instance because Kubernetes already uses CoreDNS for its own cluster DNS service. 
Let us take a look at a default DNS setup in a Kubernetes cluster because I think it is important for us to first understand how DNS queries are forwarded within the cluster. In the Kube system namespace, you have two instances of core DNS, the core DNS deployment, which handles internal Kubernetes DNS names, and the node local DNS daemon set, also an instance of core DNS, which is the cluster DNS responsible for DNS queries from all pods in the cluster. When a pod needs to resolve a DNS name, it sends the DNS query to the name server IP address configured in its resolve.com file. Now, this IP is hard-coded by Kubelet to the 10th IP of the cluster IP range and is typically set to something like this. This is the very IP address on which the node local DNS listens on. So, when node local DNS receives the query, the first thing it does is check whether the requested domain name is an internal or external domain name. If it is an internal domain name, it will forward the request to the core DNS deployment, which will be able to respond to the request. If it is an external request, though, node local DNS will check its own resolve.com file for the main DNS servers and forward requests to them. Now, the resolve.com file for node local DNS is different from the resolve.com file in all the pods in the cluster because it has to have these extra name servers configured in order for external DNS queries to be resolved. This means that queries for domain names from the internet and other clusters can be resolved. So, if we add a second cluster to our example and configure the main DNS servers with DNS records for both our clusters, we now essentially have a multi-cluster DNS setup. However, as we saw earlier, manually creating DNS records in our main DNS servers is not practical because domain names are likely being added and removed faster than even the most competent network team can create DNS records. So this is why we need to automate this with external DNS. And this is how the setup would look like. In the first Kubernetes cluster, we create an external DNS namespace. And in that namespace, we set up an etcd cluster, which will act as a storage backend for DNS records. etcd is a distributed key value store that is used for storing and retrieving data across a cluster of machines. It is supported by both core DNS and external DNS as a storage backend, which makes it perfect for this setup. We can now take a look at the Kubernetes manifest to help us spin up this etcd cluster. We define first two services, one for communication between etcd nodes and the other for external client connections. We set the etcd client service to type load balancer, which will give us a routable IP address, which will be accessed by external DNS and core DNS. Next, we define the etcd stateful set with three replicas. We set an init script, which is used for cluster formation. And finally, we provision some storage for the cluster. We can now run the kubectl apply command and spin up the etcd cluster. Second, we install external DNS. External DNS monitors the Kubernetes API for changes in services or ingresses and creates or updates DNS records and stores them in the etcd cluster we just created. So if you take a look at the external DNS manifest, here we create a cluster role with get, watch, and list permissions to the required resources like services, endpoints, and ingresses. We then create a service account, which we bind to the cluster role using a cluster role binding. And then in the deployment definition, we assign the service account to the external DNS pod. Under args, we set source to ingress, meaning we'll be scraping ingresses in this example. And then we also set provider to core DNS, which will create core DNS compatible DNS records. And then finally, we set our etcd endpoint URL. We can go ahead and apply that manifest as well which will spin up our external DNS instance. External DNS, however, is not itself a DNS server, so we need to run a DNS server alongside external DNS that can make use of the records stored in etcd. And this is where core DNS comes in. So to complete this entire setup, we deploy core DNS in the same namespace and configure it with etcd as a backend. And it is now able to retrieve the DNS information stored by external DNS. Again, we can check out the manifest for our core DNS setup. First, we need to apply the core DNS configuration, which is contained in the core DNS config map. Core DNS is configured using a core file. Taking a look at this core file, we are listening on port 53, logging all DNS queries, logging any errors as well, 
enabling health and readiness checks endpoints. And then for the important section, we are using the CD plugin to fetch DNS records from this HCD endpoint. We then enable caching, loop detection, and set the server to reload once it detects a configuration change. We can now apply the config map with kubectl apply and then quickly look at the core DNS deployment manifest. So here we are creating a core DNS deployment and simply mounting the core DNS config map at etc core DNS. We can apply that too to finish the setup. So now if you run kubectl get pods, you can see that all our pods are up and running. We can test it out by deploying this test application, which is a simple Nginx deployment with the service and ingress with the host name set to nginx.cubedc1.home.lab. Taking a look at the external DNS logs, we can see the DNS record for nginx.cubedc1.home.lab has been added successfully. As a DNS server itself, core DNS can be queried by our main DNS servers for any local records it might have. We can also test that out by running a dig command to the core DNS load balancer IP. And here we can see that the name resolution is working fine. So this entire setup eliminates the need for constantly creating or removing records manually in our main DNS servers since this is now done automatically by external DNS. We of course need to set the same setup as well in all the clusters in the organization to enable DNS resolution for domains in those clusters as well. The respective core DNS instances in each cluster can be queried by the main DNS servers, which effectively means all clusters will have access to all DNS information in the entire network. In this way, we have now successfully set up a true multi-cluster DNS setup which will maintain near real-time service discovery and connectivity between clusters. Don't forget all the manifest files and setup instructions are linked down below, so you can also take a crack at testing it out in your own environment. Hopefully, this video gives you a good rundown of setting up multi-cluster DNS with external DNS, core DNS, and etcd. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I would love to hear from you regarding what sort of videos you might like to see in the future. Please remember to like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new videos. Once again, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.